First of all, I'd like to introduce Ruwaida Abdulaziz. She's a journalist for the Huffington Post. She's a national reporter covering Islamophobia, social justice, and other issues facing the American Muslim community. She's fluent in Arabic, a native of New Jersey, and she's written numerous stories about the Middle East and covered the refugee crisis stemming from Syria, Yemen, and other parts of the Arab world. Another individual who I'm again fortunate to introduce tonight, who requires no introduction, but I'll try my best, is Congresswoman Ilhan Omar. She represents Minnesota's fifth congressional district. Prior to her election, she served in Minnesota's House of Representatives. She is one of two Muslim American women, including Rashida Talib, to enter Congress. She's the first naturalized citizen of African birth and first woman of color to represent Minnesota. She's so many firsts. She's also a member of the Congressional Progressive Caucus and has long advocated for a living wage, affordable housing, universal health care, student debt forgiveness, and many other important social and economic policy that have everyday impacts on everyone's lives. Well, we're very fortunate to have both Ruwaida and Representative Omar in a discussion to not only discuss their careers, but what it is like to be visibly Muslim in their spaces of influence. Congresswoman Omar and Ruwaida, we're so glad to have you here tonight. Congresswoman, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. It's good to see you again. Um, we have plenty to talk about, and so I'm really excited to have this conversation with you, learn a little bit about some of your thoughts on questions that I think about all the time. Um, so we are both visible hijab-wearing Muslim women um, in fields that are predominantly run by white men, and it's been a fascinating experience, at least that's one way, an interesting way for me to put it for myself. I think over the last few years, having a, a little bit of the slime light, especially as a reporter, I tend to not want to have the slime light. I wanted to focus on my work. I think this is a sentiment you can relate to. So tell me a little bit about what's that's been like for you. What is it like being a visible Muslim woman in Congress? Um, I, I I do feel incredibly uh, privileged to have the opportunity to carry the hopes and dreams um, of so many people and uh, for them to be able to see themselves represented on a national stage. Um, but I also understand uh, the weight uh, and the responsibility that comes with not only being visible, but also being a first in an environment that really wasn't uh, designed for us and created by us. I love that you mentioned the point that these spaces weren't created for us. So how do we carve them out? And I think more importantly, how have you carved it out? And how do we go beyond the first? You know, I'm, I'm certainly not the first. I'm really grateful to, to be in an industry where there have been trailblazing, not just Muslim women, but black women and women of color who, who've done this. So I look up to them. But what is that like for you? Or is there someone that you look up to? What is it like carving out that space and not just making it tolerable, but being successful at it? Yeah, I mean, my arrival in, in Congress has meant that a 181 year um, uh, rule had to be changed in order for me to even represent uh, my constituents and the people who elected me to be their voice in Congress. Uh, and I know that, um, you know, it is interesting um, to be in, in a position where, you know, you don't run <laughs> um, or you don't seek out uh, that, that position um, of representation uh, to be a first. You run to, to be a catalyst for change, to implement progress, um, to be a voice for the marginalized communities that you come from and represent. 
but you find yourself in um, in in carrying the the mantle of being a first. And I think for me, there is the the weight uh, of the pressure of trying to make sure, even though there wasn't a rule book for me um, in, in how to do this uh, and how to be an adequate representation of all the marginalized identities that I carry. Uh, to make sure that I do it right so that I'm not the only one uh, and that there is a, a bath that's being trailed um, for for others. Uh, a colleague of mine said, you know, we're not only break breaking ceilings, we are breaking concrete walls. Um, and it often makes me think about one of my um, heroes, Shirley Jism, who talked about, you know, her, her famous quote was, if um, they don't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. Uh, and for us, it's about bringing our full selves um, to every space that we are in and, and trying to make sure that those who want to celebrate our diversity are also forced to celebrate um, the unique perspectives that we bring in those positions. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's this fine line or these two, I think, different aspects that we balance between being proud of the representation and, and the milestone that brings, but also following it through with the work, right? And whether that's work in politics or for me, the work in journalism that I do and just ensuring that it's just beyond the, you know, the poster, I think, of us in our hijabs in, in these spaces. So why, on that note, why do you think it's so important to have more Muslim women in, in these spaces? And what do you think that'll do for the future? I mean, I, I think about, you know, us being part of the American fabric and, um, and, and how vital we are uh, to every aspect of, of society and how important it is that our visibility um, is, is part of the, the governance um, of, of this country. And I, I think about my predecessor, Congressman Keith Ellison, who's now the Attorney General of Minnesota. When he was elected, it was a celebration for all of us because we could finally see um, a Muslim representing us in Congress in one of the highest positions in, in this country. And that allowed uh, for so many people to feel accepted and visible and represented. Uh, and as we've now expanded uh, the number of representation, we have to include um, a Muslim hijabi and you know someone like Rashida Talib who represents a Muslim community that has been marginalized, not only in the United States, but on an international stage, uh, it you know gives I think so many young people the opportunity to know that they are not only represented, but that they they themselves um, can seek to be representatives of their own communities. Yeah, and I think with increased representation, we're less likely to be put in boxes for our opinions and our work. And I think still we're struggling to break out of this concept that we're a monolith and that we all think the same and have the same opinions and practice the same. And so I think that is also is only going to come when we have more Muslim women in, in these spaces. And so I think yeah. about that. I also reflect on some of the challenges. Um, mine is an iota compared to yours, but I think one of my biggest challenges is uh, dealing with the amount of the trolling and, um, and the negativity, especially the, the toxic um, slurs and attacks online uh, more often uh, than not. What do you do to keep doing the work that you do and, and to get, get through that? Because at least I know for me, it could be, it gets to me sometimes. I mean, we're human after all. Yeah, I mean, I, I often times, you know, am um, entertained and find it a little humorous that uh, so many people spend every waking moment um, trying to, uh, you know, spend so much energy um, in uh, 
trying to silence us and marginalize us. But I recently read um, a, a quote from Iman, who was um, one of the first supermodels um, of Somali heritage and of Muslim heritage. Mm -hmm. And she said, um, don't worry about the criticisms of those you wouldn't seek to get advice from. Uh, and so it is really um, a mental state that you have to create for yourself to know that these are not people who have um, care in the world <laughs> about how you feel and, um, and, and what you represent. They are often threatened by uh, the, the kind of change your visibility um, creates and are trying to often limit the amount of space you're willing to take up um, because they don't see you as part of what creates uh, a vibrant, um, thriving society um, and an inclusive one that celebrates the diversity of, of our nation. Uh, and so if we are not willing to take advice from these people um, and we shouldn't be willing to actually give um, space to their criticism. Yeah, I think finding the the wisdom to differentiate between what's worth addressing and what isn't worth addressing. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it just speaks to the fact that you don't know where your supporters are, just the, the, the sheer idea of something being too, too big of a dream that, you know, the people who want it for you just, you know, may become your naysayers in, in that way. And so um, it gets me thinking the fact with AMI celebrating its five year anniversary more now more than ever, we were thinking about having support networks to, to support us and to engage you know, members of the American Muslim community so that we have a little bit more of that increased representation that we were talking about earlier. Why do you think it's important for organizations, whether it's AMI or other Muslim American organizations are able to exist and what potentials do they have for members of our community at large? First, congratulations to the American Muslim Institution for reaching your five-year anniversary. The work that you do uh, in engaging our community is very pivotal in ensuring Muslim voices are heard in all sectors of our community. I am encouraged to know that there are organizations like yours out there supporting and uplifting our communities. Thank you so much, Congresswoman, for joining us today and for this really insightful conversation. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Rowena.